Ed Wood, the genius director, decided, I know how to handle this problem. I know how to fix this. He got his wife's chiropractor to fill in for Bela Lugosi. He said, here's the cape. And he said, you're about his height, so you're perfect. That was the criteria, his height. And he said, keep your face covered with the cape. Don't let anybody see your face. They'll think it's Lugosi. And then problem solved. Yes, you can definitely tell that it is not Lugosi <laughs> in the film. Um, like I said, his face was covered, so it was mostly for establishing shots, exterior shots, coming out of his house, that kind of thing. Uh, the working title of the film was not Plan 9, but Grave Robbers from Outer Space. Why the change in title? Because the individual who financed the film, J. Edward Reynolds, was a devout Southern Baptist, and he felt that grave robbers was sacrilegious. He also said that in order to finance the film, Ed Wood and a couple of his colleagues would have to be baptized. This is depicted in the 1994 Tim Burton film. So they agreed to be baptized, they got the cash for the film, and we have the film to enjoy today, to this day. And, oh, and uh, <laughs> Ms. Nermy said that she wanted no spoken lines of dialogue. And I have to say, on a personal note, can't say I blame her once you get a load of the quality of the dialogue in this brief clip. I would want to remain silent as well. Even now, your scientists are working on a way to harness the sun's rays. The rays of sunlight are by new particles. Is it so far from your imagination they cannot do as I have suggested? Why, a particle of sunlight can't even be seen or measured. Can you see or measure an atom? Yet you can explode one. A ray of sunlight is made up of many atoms. So what if we do develop this solar line bomb? We'd be even a stronger nation than now. Strong. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. So I'm taking from you. Get back here, you Let him finish. Nothing like an evil extraterrestrial calling you stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> like a petulant child. <laughs> so that's Plan 9 from Out of Space. <laughs> Tomorrow's Bela's birthday. The 20th. Yep. Bela Lugosi, born October 20th. He, yeah, uh, uh, in, in addition to Dracula and of course the Ed Wood films that he did, he also played uh, Igor, the insane shepherd in Son of Frankenstein and Ghost of Frankenstein. And then he finally played Frankenstein's creature in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, I believe it was. I think that's the way it was. And did you know, look in Google, do a Google image search. Before he did any of these movies, back in his native Hungary, he portrayed Christ oh, yeah. in the Passion Play. <laughs> so to see images of that juxtaposed with images of him as Count Dracula, it's a little disconcerting. <laughs> but. Eh, that speaks to his talent. So, Plan 9 from Out of Space, I would say on a scale from 1 to 10 golden raspberries, if we're talking sheer entertainment value only, I would give it an 8 out of 10. If we're talking, like, legitimate quality, it's in this presentation, so I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> so, Butterfield 8 is the next one, and no, that is not a typo. In the title, the U is capitalized because it's supposed to be the telephone exchange back in the day. So this is the film that got Hollywood legend Elizabeth Taylor her first Academy Award win. She had been sick in the hospital. And so the press, the paparazzi, you know, the tabloids were making it out, you know, she had, I think it was pneumonia, and they made it out to be that she was practically, you know, she was hanging on to life by a thread. And I'm not denying that she was sick, she was sick. Um, but once she recovered and she attended the Academy Awards ceremony, uh, you can see that physically she was, you know, tired, she was lethargic, she was happy. But she also said that this film, Butterfield 8, was probably one of the worst films that she ever made if not the worst. I loved it. So, <laughs> uh, I like, we all have different opinions. She hated it. She, I don't think it's that bad. <laughs> I think she got the Academy Award where she brushed her teeth. Oh, no. <laughs> it was, 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 it was,
That's true. Anything from the That's not something that, you know, the in Hollywood glamour age that you would have been seen doing. So, and Lawrence Harvey and Eddie Fisher, I mean, this is a, you know, this is a good cast too. So the plot is, is that she is a lady of the evening by night and by day she is a struggling model. And her mother has no idea what she does at nighttime to earn some extra cash. Her mother is very prim and proper. And what happens when her character, when Elizabeth Taylor's character, that is, falls in love with a married man? Now, some praised the film not for its quality, but for Elizabeth Taylor's bravery, because basically it is an on-screen depiction of how she and Eddie Fisher <laughs> got together and broke up Eddie Fisher's and Debbie Reynolds' marriage. I think I'd have to look it up. Eddie, I think Eddie Fisher was husband's number three? Well, Connie, Connie Stevens. Stevens. Yeah, Connie Stevens. Debbie Reynolds. I th I'd have to Google it. I mean, she was married to Richard Burton twice, and she was married a total of seven times. Yeah, Richard Burton was after Eddie Fisher. Richard Burton was after Eddie Fisher, yeah. yeah. Both times he was after. She was with a writer first, wasn't she? And then the baseball player? Yes, and she was with Mike Todd. And Mike Todd was the one who died in the Mike plane crash. Todd, yeah. And so. then she was with Senator Warner. Yes. John Warner. John Warner. That's right, that's right. That's it. But uh, you know, she, she lived a colorful life. And of course, she's a legend in her own time and beyond. And Butterfield 8, the movie that got her Oscar gold, she herself spoke poorly of. Here's the trailer. seen this one. Okay. 
Um, did you know that it was inspired by a true story? What happened was John O'Hara wrote the novel. The novel was published in 1935, and it was going to be made into a movie, but the production code at the time, the censorship board at the time said, oh, no, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> we, don't, we don't address such things in the movies. So the story was inspired by a 25-year-old woman by the name of Star Faithful. She was a lady of the evening, and her body washed up on the shores of Long Island in 1931. And of course, the tabloids had a field day with that one. Um, I already mentioned how Elizabeth Taylor does not regard this film as a good one, um, and she half-jokingly, half-seriously said it was a pity win, a pity Academy Award. Um, Eddie Fisher and Elizabeth Taylor did appear to, well, Elizabeth Taylor started in a film with Montgomery Clift and Katherine Hepburn called Suddenly Last Summer, and Eddie Fisher had a brief uncredited appearance in it, so technically, but a field date is their second film together. But if we're talking about being billed, you know, in the credits and all of that, this is their first film together and their only film together. I do have here the clip from the Academy Awards from when Elizabeth Taylor received her Oscar. Here she is giving her acceptance speech. Good evening, y'all. Good evening, Robert. Yul Brenner. And thank you very much. For what? For your restraint and fine taste in refraining from mentioning my uh, hair. <laughs> Just a few lines I plan to use if Guy Kibbe showed up. Carry on. Now this year there were many magnificent performances by actresses. The five nominated were Mia Gossett in Sunrise at Campobello, Deborah Carr in The Sundowners, Shirley MacLaine in The Apartments, Melina Mercury in Never on Sunday, and Elizabeth Taylor in Buckfield 8. Please. Elizabeth Taylor. win her second Academy Award for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf about six years later. Seven years after Butterfield 8, there was a movie that came out that got a lot of publicity. The media built the, the advertising, the, like the press buildup was out of this world. It was based on the best-selling novel, Valley of the Dolls. And the movie version came out in 1967 directed by Mark Robson. Patty Duke, she was an Academy Award winner for The Miracle Worker, playing Helen Keller, and she had her, of course, she had her own television sitcom, The Patty Duke Show, where she played 
herself and her own identical cousin. You know, they're, they're cousins in every way, remember that song? So she wanted to graduate to more adult roles and she wanted to be taken seriously as an actress. And she thought that a story like Valley of the Dolls would be a perfect starring vehicle for her. Not only because it was meaty, dramatic material, but also because there was already a built-in fan base for the story because the book, the sales of the book were completely off the charts. This was the book to read. Now, it has been regarded as, the book, I mean, has been regarded as rather pulpy, rather trashy, and the film really was not called anything different. <laughs> um, it was a, like I said, it was one of the biggest films that the studio was really pushing in terms of, you know, sinking all the money into all of the, you know, the, they, 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 did a, they did a cruise in Europe where they had a screening of the film for the press and they, re they pulled out all the stops trying to build up anticipation for this film. And the screening on the cruise was a disaster to the point where the cast of the film, they were all like, for the rest of the cruise, like trying to dodge the reporters every chance they got, so they probably stayed in their staterooms. Um, the, the story is that you have three young women, and they all have their own storylines that intersect. They're all friends. Three young women, and they all have their own um, inner demons, and they all become hooked on what they call dolls. The dolls refers to pills, pill addiction. And you know, whether it's amphetamines or whether it's, you know, uppers or downers or sleeping pills or what have you. And, you know, they're all trying to make it in the big bad world of Hollywood. And Patty Duke, she deals with instant stardom and then the instant decline once she shows eccentric behavior on set and ruins her reputation as a professional. You have Barbara Parkins and you also have the beautiful Sharon Tate. And Sharon Tate portrays a character named Jennifer, who is, struggles to be taken seriously as an actress, but is seen as nothing more than eye candy. And so she meets a man, they fall in love, they get married, and then he falls ill, and to pay for his medical bills, his sister, her sister-in-law, encourages her to make adult films, to pay for the medical bills. I know how that sounds, that's just, one example of just how, like this is your sister-in-law you're talking to. Uh, this was a, th this, is, this is definitely one of those films where you finish watching it and you say to yourself afterwards, what the hell did I just see? <laughs> what was that? So, you know, they, family feuds, the whole thing. I think the best way that we can do justice, and I use the word justice loosely, is to show you the trailer. Yes, it is. Now, the motion picture that shows what America's all-time number one best seller first put into words. I wasn't much of a man living with you, neither, but that's all right. I'm straightened out now. Fingernail and claw fighter who went down swinging. She took the 
dollar bills. Look, they drummed you right out of Hollywood. So you can call them back to Broadway. Well, Broadway doesn't go for booms and dope. And get out of my way. I've got a guy waiting for me. Such a switch from a bag they're usually stuck with. At least I never had a married one. You take that back and your hands on that. Dimensions both startling and hotly discussed best seller now on the screen with every shock and sensation intact. I think I can sleep with you here in this house. This wonderful old house. Can you beside me that Martha's old four post clips too? It's a marriage bed, Lyle. I was thinking of marriage. Really? I'm pregnant. Oh, Helen, come on. Here you your hair can't hurt you. <laughs> You bet your ass you can, because she isn't going to get the chance. Now, the all-time bestseller is the motion picture you wanted it to be. Or not. So, Patty Duke honestly thought that this was going to be the film that would be for her career a big breakthrough in terms of proving that she can do more adult oriented roles, you know, more sophisticated material than silly sitcom slapstick. She chose an unfortunate vehicle, but it was based on the number one bestseller of all time, so all signs point, I'm sure it looked great on paper. So she had signed on. Now, as far as the author of the book, Jacqueline Suzanne, she saw the film and pitched a fit. She said, they ruined my book. <laughs> she said, they completely trashed my book. They made it into this piece of you know what. Uh, the book was published in 1966, and in the 70s, it was listed in Guinness as the best-selling book of all time. 30 million copies sold. So that surpasses Gone with the Wind, which was the number one bestseller of all time. Jacqueline Suzanne has gone on record as saying that if she had her dream casting, she would have had Ursula Andress as Jennifer instead of Sharon Tate. She would have loved to have had Grace Kelly in her film, quote, if she'd lose 10 to 15 pounds, end quote. And she would love to have had Shirley MacLaine in the Patty Duke role. And she would love to have had Betty Davis as Helen Lawson, played in the film by Susan Hayward who actually replaced Judy Garland. Judy Garland was initially gonna play the role, but she was kicked off the film when her life imitated art. I mean, I'm not trash talking Judy Garland. I mean, her life story was really a sad one. But uh, she also wanted, Jacqueline Suzanne also wanted Elvis in the film as well. That would have been her dream cast, she said. But she hated the film itself, and it's campy. It's overacted outrageously. It is unintentionally hilarious. And it's, uh, I mean, a lot of it is dated. A lot, of the, a lot of the lines of dialogue are dated using terms that we don't use today. But there is one quick scene here in which Patty Duke and Susan Hayward, you saw a little bit of it when she rips the wig off. How'd you like to see the whole scene with what she does with that wig? So the context is they're backstage from a Broadway show, they're both in. Um, Patty Duke has already been, her character, has already been drummed out of Hollywood for her addictions and unreliability, unprofessional unreliability. So she came crawling back to Broadway, as Susan Hayward said, uh, trying to resuscitate her career. I've already turned down the part you're playing. And of course, Susan Hayward is the Broadway veteran. not that crazy. You should know, honey. You just came out of the nut house. It was not a nut house. Look, they drummed you right out of Hollywood. So you come crawling back to Broadway. Well, Broadway doesn't go for booze and dope. Now you get out of my way, because I've got a man waiting for me. Like I said, outdated terminology. Well, the bags are usually stuck with. At least I never married one. You take that back, you
away. How do I get out of here? You can go through the kitchen. It's right next door. I'm sorry, Miss Paulson. What an awful thing to do to a great star like you. I'll go out the way I came in. Very dramatic. I thought she looked fine. <laughs> she looked absolutely fine. But apparently it was supposed to be really, I don't know, <laughs> really bad. Speaking of really bad, I do need to preface this next film by saying that this is probably, for me personally, um, if you're a horror movie fan, this is one to see. Not because it's a horror movie that is not to be missed, but because it's a fine example of what not to do. So, after you have a classic, groundbreaking, disturbing, and controversial box office behemoth like 1973's The Exorcist, a sequel is going to be inevitable. But did it have to be this bad? <laughs> it is widely called the worst sequel ever made, certainly the worst horror sequel ever made. Linda Blair does return as the same character, Reagan McNeil, Ellen Burstyn decided to sit this one out. <laughs> Ellen Burstyn appears as her mother in the original and has not done an exorcist film since until the one that's currently in theaters. <laughs> so Linda Blair, Richard Burton, Louise Fletcher, who just got the Oscar for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, James Earl Jones, and Max von Sydow, he returns from the original as well. So again, like I was saying with Valley of the Dolls, on paper, I'm sure everything looked great. They all signed on because they read a script and to this day, Linda Blair says it was a great script. But then the studio got involved and then conflicts with the director got involved between the studio and the director. And the ending was, uh, de they demanded that the ending be uh, changed. They demanded that this scene be taken out and that scene be taken out. If you take a look at this film now from beginning to end, it is an incoherent mess. There is absolutely no story that makes any sense whatsoever. I want to reassure you, I'm not going to be showing you any scenes that involve turning of heads or pea soup or anything like that. I'm just going to play the trailer. Uh, the premise of this film is that the demon that had possessed Reagan McNeil in the original uh, apparently still lurks within her. Go figure. And uh, Richard Burton's character, Father Lamont, uh, he comes around and he tries to help. So, this is a trailer for the Blu-ray DVD. Four years ago, the exorcist shot the world. Now, the struggle between good and evil goes on. Exorcist 2, The Heretic. Just listen to the soundtrack alone. <laughs>
that skull give you chills? <laughs> I think it makes an excellent music video. I don't know what's going on. Well, that was, that, the trailer t tells more of a coherent story than the film does. <laughs> you can believe it makes no no sense whatsoever. Who's the heretic? Well, that's just it. They don't even answer that question. Oh, it's like, is, is Linda Blair's character the heretic? Is it Richard Burton's character? Is it the demon? Like, they don't even answer it. Like, the subtitle was thrown in probably because they thought it sounded cool. So, <laughs> it's just so... <laughs> it, was, it was awful. It was an awful, awful mess. So, this was a definite candidate for tonight's presentation. <laughs> um, it has to be seen to be believed. It really does. Uh, the acting is just, I mean, I'm sure it was the way that they were directed, but they all said this was not the movie that we signed on to make. In fact, I have here a quote from uh, Linda Blair, third bullet point. That script was rewritten five times. <laughs> so the movie we set out to make never happened. Too many cooks spoiled the brew, and in this case, it's what affected this movie. We all left with great disappointment, I believe. Certainly, I know I did. The weird thing is, is that Tarantino and Scorsese love this movie and actually prefer it to the original. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but um, she, in fact, Linda Blair, she almost didn't make the movie because she had left acting. You know, she had done The Exorcist, she was nominated for an Academy Award, she did Airport 75, she was the sick girl on the plane, she did a few TV movies like Born Innocent, and by the time the late 70s rolled around, she decided that she was going to leave the business and she wanted to go to uh, veterinary school. And she had applied and that was her ambition to become a vet, and then the script came along the Exorcist 2 script came along. Warner Brothers tried to woo her back. They said, you'll be top billed this time. You'll be the lead in the film. And she said, well. And they said, here's the script. She read it and she said, well. And then she was told Richard Burton had signed on. And she said, I'd be a fool not to. You know, you only know what you know at the time. And I probably would have done the same thing if I had been in her position. The chance to work with Richard Burton and Louise Fletcher and to be the top billed actor in the film. But then, of course, opening night, scathing audience reviews and reaction. Uh, according to the director of the film, John Borman, there were riots in the streets. According to him, he told, he told the story more than once of how he and a couple of Warner Brothers executives were sitting in the balcony of the theater and the audience was getting so rowdy within the first 15 minutes laughing and throwing things at the screen that a couple of guys stood up and they turned and they saw them up in the balcony and they said, they screamed out to everyone else, the people responsible for making this movie are sitting right up there, let's go get them. And then they <laughs> flee, they run out of the balcony and they flee out into the streets and down the street. And according to the story he told, they all chased them down the street with like, you know, throwing things at them. <laughs> Make of it what you will. I mean, I'm sure it's an exaggerated story, although sometimes when I watch the news and they're like, Maybe I can see that happening. <laughs> I don't know. But that, that's the story that he was fond of telling and retelling over the years. So, oh, I do have here a clip. And there's not, nothing, nothing happens in this clip relating to anything supernatural. Um, it's a hoot. An unintentional hoot. Um, Linda Blair, Reagan, her character Reagan, is arriving for her psychiatric appointment. And she comes across a little girl who, is, who has not spoken in a long time. She's autistic. And she strikes up a conversation with her. And if the little girl looks familiar, it's Dana Plato, Kimberly Drummond from Different Strokes, that TV sitcom with, you know, Arnold and Willis and so. But what makes this scene hysterical is one line that poor Linda Blair is given to say and expected to say with a straight face. You'll know it when you hear it.
talking now. Yes, you are. I can hear you. in the world. Jodie Foster could not deliver that line with a straight face. So, I mentioned earlier how the acting was a bit weak, but uh, every time I see a scene from this film, it's, it's the script. <laughs> it's, it's the quality of the dialogue. Uh, I can't imagine. Well, speaking of John Borman, who directed this film, I have here a uh, tufa because another film he directed is coming up next, and that is 1981's Excalibur. This is the story of King Gotha told in John Borman style. Uh, what can I say? Nigel Terry, Helen Mirren, Liam, Liam Neeson, Patrick Stewart. I mean, this is, a, this is a stacked cast. So it's the King Arthur legend. Merlin the magician puts a magical sword stuck inside an anvil on top of a stone. Whoever pulls the sword out of the stone is destined to be the King of Britain. We're all familiar with that tale, right? But the way John Bowman tells the story, it's a little over the top. <laughs> The wizard's ancient spell. To the eyes of the dragon and the despair. I think his costume was made out of aluminum must, foil. Oh, <laughs> I must have her. One night with her. Give birth to an empire. Behold the sword of power. Excalibur. Thanks. Uh -huh. 
don't know about you, but I'm feeling all goose pimply. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ken Gotha's father in the film, has anybody seen that PBS, uh, PBS, I'm sorry, that British, the BBC, the BBC sitcom Keeping Up Appearances from the 90s? Hyacinth Bouquet, well, Hyacinth Bucket, oh no, it's, it's pronounced Bouquet. Her husband is in this film, uh, the actor who plays her husband, Clive, Clive Swift. Uh, the movie is filmed entirely in Ireland, and according to John Borman, after he yelled cut in a scene that involved extras fighting each other, they continued fighting each other, quote, to settle old scores, end quote. Uh, but again, this is also the same guy who told the story of being chased down the street outside of the theater by an angry crowd, so with the screening of Exorcist 2. Um, Liam Neeson and Helen Mirren, they met making this movie and they proceeded to fall in love. They lived together for four years. And The Exorcist and The Exorcist 2's very own Max von Sydow, he was originally going to play the character of Merlin the Magician. John Bowman wanted Donald Sutherland, uh, but he was tied up filming the 1980 Best Picture winner, Ordinary People. So, <laughs> he chose the better vehicle, of course. Uh, here is a clip where King Arthur pulls the sword out of the anvil and the stone and learns of his true calling. He is, at this point, a lowly squire to his older brother, Kay. K-A-Y. So here they are at a jousting tournament, and there's Mr. Bouquet. A good squire doesn't forget his knight's sword. I looked at the tent, Father. Well, hurry then and get it. The actor playing young Arthur, his voice was dubbed. So you'll see as he talks that his mouth is not in sync with the dialogue that you hear him speak. The big moment. Your sword is stolen, Kay. Yeah, pretty quickly. Rise, father, please. I was your son before I became your king. If I am king, you are king. The more so because you're not my son, and I'm not your father. Not my father? That Kay is not my brother? Merlin the magician brought you to me when you were newly born, a 
and bade me raise you as my own. At first I did so because I feared Merlin, but later because I loved you. Who is my true father? Only Merlin can tell you that. And who is Merlin? <laughs> I. <laughs> Whose son am I? You are the son of Uther and the grain. You are King Arthur. So, that's Excalibur. 1981's Excalibur. Modern Python just ruined all... Oh, see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do see the time, so I'll be cherry-picking from the clips that I have. Uh, Police Academy. I had to throw in a comedy here somewhere. This is a movie that tries very hard to be funny, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. Uh, the sequels, definitely, I think they went on to, like, Police Academy 8, I think they reached... Um, I can remember one critic saying, it's like a curse. Every spring a new Police Academy movie is released, and every spring it becomes the number one movie in America for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, but the original with Steve Gutenberg and Kim Cattrall and Bubba Smith and G.W. Bailey and Michael Winslow, there's not much of a plot to speak of. It's just a series of, series of gags edited together. They threw them all into a bag, shook it up, spelled it up, and said, maybe we just made a movie. So Police Academy is about a gang of misfits who decide that they are going to enroll in the city's police academy because the academy, desperate for new recruits, has lowered the standards, so they're accepting more and more people now. Uh, naturally, the established police completely freak, as the opening title cards tell us. And it's all just a bunch of slapstick comedy, hijinks, uh, idiocy and pranks, and it's 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 fun to watch the first one at least. <laughs> so um, I do have here the trailer. We'll play the trailer at least. Crime. The city was full of it. Hey, three TVs. Desperate measures were needed. Want you to go to the police? Yeah. The police tag is such a dangerous place. Honey. Desperate measures were taken. I'm joining the police force! Ah! The mayor says we have to take this riffraff. I'm trapped here? Oh, yes. We all are. What about guns? What do we do with guns? You won't be screwed. You fire arms. Police procedures, no proof of us. Many, many other things. Initially, Michael Keaton was going to star in this film, in the Steve Gutenberg role, and the director, initially, was going to be Dom DeLuise, if you can believe it. Bruce Willis auditioned for the lead role. Roger Ebert wrote, it's so bad, maybe you should pool your money and draw straws and send one of the guys off to rent it so that in the future, whenever you think you're sitting through a bad comedy, he could shake his head and chuckle tolerantly and explain that you don't know what bad is. Ouch. <laughs> we'll skip the clip. Like I said, I do see the time. 
1986, also with Kim Cattrall, saw Big Trouble in Little China, released in theaters, directed by John Carpenter. A wisecracking tough trucker and his best friend confront an ancient sorcerer. It's a supernatural tale. It's pat comedy, pat martial arts movie, pat action thriller, and it's set beneath the streets of Chinatown. Kurt Russell, and this is probably one of the films he is most fondly remembered for. He did a number of films with John Carpenter, including this and The Thing. This is Jack Burton in the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. It's a pretty amazing planet we live on here. Now, man, it'd have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. There is a hidden world where ancient evil weaves a modern mystery. What's going on here? It's some kind of magic. The darkest magic. Oh. They call it Little China. Finally, we shall bring order of chaos. Twentieth Century Fox wanted to have not Kim Cattrall as the female lead, but they wanted to have a female rock star in the role. They didn't care who. They told him to go to hell. just where he's going. Somebody, I don't care who, tell me what is going on. Set in modern day San Francisco, the initial concept was 1890s San Francisco, sort of was like a throwback to the Westons, but uh, then they changed their minds. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, 1991, starring Christina Applegate. Allegedly, Winona Ryder was interested in the role, but she eventually had to turn it down, citing exhaustion after doing so many movies all at once. And Ed O'Neill, Christina Applegate's on-screen TV father and married with children. He was friends with one of the producers, and so he had access to the script, and he personally gave it to Applegate, saying, yeah, you might be interested in making this movie. And the plot, which is utterly absurd, you have a single mother with five kids, and she leaves them alone for the entire summer to go on vacation by herself to Australia, and she hires an elderly babysitter to come and stay with them for those couple of months. This is not a spoiler, it's in the title. Within the first 10, 15 minutes of the film, the babysitter dies, and so what they decide to do is to put her inside a box and leave her on the front doorstep of the mortuary with a note saying, nice little old lady inside died of natural causes, and they decide that they're gonna have the summer of their lives free of parental authority and any authority for that matter. So. Christina Applegate's character, she decides that she is going to get a job and she fakes a resume and she lies her way to the position of executive assistant at some big fashion company. I'm getting rid of her for two of them months. I can go to the beach, I can stay out as late as I want, I can do anything. I'm a free woman. Okay. 
That's Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. It was a teen comedy released in the summer of 91. Um, it was initially going to be called The Real World, but that's around the time that the MTV series premiered, and they didn't want to have any copyright infringement. The following year, Death Becomes Her, with Bruce Willis, Meryl Streep, Goldie Hawn, and Isabella Rossellini. And I'm just going to, you know what, let's skip the trailer so I can just play you the clip from the film. So, the director is Robert Zemeckis, who had just done the Back to the Future trilogy, and he was excited to do, as he put it, more mature material. Uh, <laughs> so basically, what you have is an aging actress um, who... I can't even explain the plot. Let's just say that the two of them are both given these treatments, uh, you know, scientific treatments to, to live forever, and uh, Bruce Willis is the, uh, the mad scientist who comes up with this uh, concoction, and Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn get into a fight with spades, a couple of spades, and uh, in real life, as they were filming the scene, Meryl Streep accidentally gave Goldie Hawn a scar in her face. It's a comedy. <clears throat> Bitch! Girls! Girls! Let's just calm down and show we can settle this peacefully and then... You should learn not to compete with me! I always win! Ha! Ha! You may have always won, but you never played fair! Oh! Who oh. oh. cares how I played? I won! Hell. I'll just be upstairs. So that's Death Becomes Her. <laughs> Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger, probably one of the most popular stars of all time, and uh, <laughs> who probably has a resume that's the most dubious of all time. Jingle All the Way is a special holiday celebration where he spends the entire movie on Christmas Eve trying to find the perfect gift for his son, who he neglects all the time year round because he is a workaholic. So the film co-stars Sinbad, who was on the sitcom Different World, the spinoff of, uh, of Cosby. And Jingle All the Way was meant to be a satire of commercialism of Christmas and consumerism. Instead, it just turned into one big question mark. season, 
There's one toy everyone has to have. They even ripped off the score to Home Alone in the trailer here. Is this father's nightmare? I'll get that toy. I promise. Whoa! Nothing like waiting until the last minute, Alex, sir. Especially on Christmas Eve. Does that look bad or does that look bad? <laughs> Let's say that's Anakin Skywalker in the Phantom Menace. Yep. I'm gonna skip the uh, trailer and clips from the room. The room probably is the 21st century film that has the reputation for being the worst ever made, kind of like Plan 9 from Out of Space. It was written and directed and stars a person who was very earnest and v took filmmaking very seriously. It's developed a cult following. They have special screenings for it at places like the Coolidge Corner Theater. They have live Q and A's. I mean, this is a movie that is very poorly written and acted, and it's, it's unbelievable if you were to see it. Um, a bank executive lives happily with his fiance, Lisa, until he, see, until he finds out that she has been cheating on him with his best friend. That's the plot. So we have basically an entire film's worth of him moping around, feeling sorry for himself and nurturing a grudge. And honestly, that's the story. <laughs> that's the story. Um, but the star of the film, Tommy Wiseau, he wrote it, he directed it. And maybe you are familiar with a film called The Disaster Artist with James Franco, came out about five, maybe six years ago. Uh, that's all about the making of this movie. The Disaster Artist is all about the room. But again, I, I do see the time, so I'll skip the clip. 2008's Mamma Mia, some may object to my including this film, uh, but it's fun. You know, like, this, it's guilty pleasures. Guilty pleasures. Uh, is there anybody who has not seen this one? Okay, you familiar with the premise? Yeah, so, vaguely. So Meryl Streep, single mother, she has a daughter who's 20, daughter's getting married. Uh, the daughter never knew who her father was. Um, turns out, as she reads her mother's diary, that uh, she has three possible fathers. So without her mother's knowledge, she secretly invites all three men. I don't know how she gets their addresses, but she contacts all three men, invites them to her wedding so that she can determine once and for all which one is her father. They are played by P.S. Brosnan, James Bond himself, Stellan Skarsgård and Colin Firth. Meryl Streep is Donna, the mother. Amanda Seyfried is her daughter, Sophie. And we also have Julie Harris and, I'm sorry, Julie Walters. Julie Walters and, um, uh, from Sybil, uh, Christine Baranski, who was also in uh, Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So, we'll skip the trailer and 
I will say, as a closing, don't ignore your guilty pleasure, because guilty pl life is too short not to enjoy a bad movie every once in a while. And if you'd like, I can play for you as a closing clip. You know, I'll, play, I'll lower the volume and I'll play it, and I will call out the three winning raffle numbers. How's that? So, enjoy Dancing Queen. So, everybody have your tickets out? For your next movie night, you get a popcorn bin. I have for you the popcorn. And to keep track of all these movies that you'd like to see, a movie-themed pencil, which you'll see better close up. <laughs> so, and the first winning number is 496482. Same prize, and the second winning number is... 496481. Must have been the gentleman who left. 496481. I'll pull out another one here. 496 478. And the last one, you get the same prize. And for your next movie night, you also get the movie, the grand prize. Die, Mommy, Die, which is a comedy, which has. Uh, among other people in the cast, Jason Priestley, Philip Baker Hall, Francis Conroy, Charles Bush. I mean, this is truly, you've heard of it? <laughs> it's camp at its worst. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the ticket number is 496-479. Oh, this, oh, thank you. All right, 496, 483. <laughs> now you'll find out what all the fuss is about. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you again for coming. Very much appreciate it. See you at the movies and, <laughs> and here we have. That's <laughs> with the score. Yeah. They're making a third one. They're making a third one. The director says she has always envisioned it as a trilogy. I, 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 I,